A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. During the sixth year of the Hijra, the Prophet وسلم, had a dream. He saw a dream in which he saw himself performing tawaf around the Kaaba. And this dream led up to a series of events that led up to the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. That the Muslims set out to perform Umrah at this time. And this is significant because at this time the community of the Muslims was as a point at a point where it was very small, but it was ready to expand. It was just at the point at which it was just about to expand into a huge community. And so there's a lot of lessons that we learn from this this example of the of the story that leads up to the Treaty of Hudaybiyah in how the Prophet ﷺ was able to lead his community during his time and what he was able to provide for them. So the Prophet ﷺ and his companions decided that they were going to go on Umrah. And the Umrah that they performed was not like the Umrah that we perform today where we go on a plane or go by car to the city of Mecca and we have air conditioning and all these resources. But this was an Umrah that they had to perform on foot. And to put things in perspective, the distance from Medina to Mecca is 270 miles. That this distance, if you've ever driven from Medina to Mecca, is completely covered in nothing but desert and rocks and mountainous terrain. That it's extremely harsh terrain that you have to travel for weeks on weeks if you're doing this by foot or by caravan. And that the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they went out in full ihram and they made all the preparations and went on this journey that took them weeks. And it was not an easy journey, but they set out for it because they were doing something for the sake of Allah. And after this extremely difficult journey, now put yourself in the perspective of someone who has just traveled for weeks and has now reached Mecca. What happened when they got there? They were expecting that the Quraysh would allow them to enter Mecca, allow them to enter the city and perform their pilgrimage, as was according to the tradition that they should allow them to do something like this. But when they got there, the Quraysh refused. They said that you cannot enter. So now the Prophet ﷺ is faced with a decision. He has to figure out what to do now that he's here and his people are here. And what does he do? He does not respond in a way that is angry. He does not insist on entering the city. Instead, what he does is he demonstrates wisdom and patience in that he negotiates with the people of Quraysh, in that he understands his strategic position within the greater society as a whole. And he, with that understanding, he negotiates a treaty that's built based upon his relative position, his ability to negotiate. And what are the terms of this treaty that he does? What, is, what, is, what does he get out of it? That in exchange for not performing Umrah, that they have to return this year and they can come back next year to perform Umrah, that they were able to get 10 years of peace, which was part of the agreement. And in addition to that, that the Quraysh would have the right to call back any person who traveled to Medina, that they would have the right to claim any person back to their land. But that the Prophet ﷺ would not have the right to call that person back. If someone went from Medina to Mecca, he would not have the right to call back and, and bring that person back from Mecca. In other words, many of the terms of this treaty were favorable to the Quraysh. And many of the Sahaba were uh, a bit disappointed about this, that there was some resentment. That, oh, why have you done this? Why have you accepted this? You know, and it's understandable because after traveling for so long with such an intention to perform, to perform Umrah, to have to turn back, it's difficult, right? But we see in the example of the Prophet wasallam the wisdom inherent in showing patience here. And it seemed at the time that this was a big loss for the Muslims, that they had basically conceded defeat because they had to, that this was not a good thing. And when the companions were complaining about this, the verse was revealed from the Quran that not only saying that this is a good thing, but that this is an, an inherent victory. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. Indeed, we have given you a clear victory. So that Allah may forgive you for what sins you have committed in the past and what is to come before you, ahead of you. And so that the blessings of Allah 
may come to pass and that he may guide you to the straight path. And so that Allah may bless you with a great victory. And the surah goes on and on in that direction. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that not only has the Prophet ﷺ made a prudent decision, but he has shown a great wisdom in what he has done. And there's a lesson for us here in understanding that as our communities grow and as, our, as more people come into our community, that we need to think strategically in terms of how we interact with other people, in terms of how we build up our community. That it's not always a situation where I want this and that's it, but sometimes I have to give others what they want in exchange for something that I want. And sometimes I don't always get what I want, but I have to think in the long run, in terms of what's best for my community as a whole. That as our community grows, that more and more people are going to come in and there are going to be different viewpoints, different perspectives coming in. And if I want to really be in a position where I can make that grow forward, and I can promote unity in that situation where there are all these ideas and different types of perspectives going around, then I have to be willing to compromise in a way that is, that is wise and strategic, in a way that I'm thinking not just in the short term what our community wants to do, but all of these programs that we do, we want to have some sort of strategy behind them. That instead of having one masjid here, one masjid there, one program here, one event there, that we want to think about how we can integrate all of these things and have a broader strategy in terms of what we want to accomplish in the long run. Because that's the kind of thing that the Prophet ﷺ had in mind. What did he accomplish with this treaty that appeared to be so detrimental at the time? For one thing, he achieved peace. That there would be no fighting for some period of time. And that's a good thing in itself. The other thing, he did in fact get to perform Umrah. He was patient in showing that we wait one year, but then they come back and then they perform Umrah and they end up getting what they wanted in the first place. But there's things even deeper than that. When the Quraysh eventually broke the treaty and they attacked one of the allies of the Prophet wasallam, because they had done that, that gave the Prophet full justification to conquer Makkah. And if they had not done this treaty, they would not have had that justification. And because now they had that justification, they were fully in the right in doing what they were doing. That he thought, thought this far ahead, that he had that sort of strategical position, that if they were to violate this treaty, then they would be able to do this with justification. These were the things that he had established by doing this. And it was not a position where he was saying, this is what I want and I just want to have it now. But he was willing to embrace this sort of idea of negotiating, that he didn't shy away from the politics of the situation, but he was willing to embrace it because he knew what he was doing and he knew what he wanted to accomplish. When Ali radiallahu anhu, he was the scribe who was writing down the treaty, even he, he showed hesitations about it. When he initially wrote down the treaty, he wrote down Muhammad, Prophet of God, as, as the name. And the Quraysh looked at it and they said, no, you can't write this, you have to erase this, because we don't accept him as the Prophet. You know, you, you can't write that. And Ali, of course, you know, he's a devout believer. He said, no, I'm not erasing that because this is what I believe. Right? And this is a point of tension that's about to develop, that the treaty could fall apart right here over this point. And what did the Prophet ﷺ do? He erased it himself. Not only did he ask Ali to erase it, but he erased it himself to show a sense of wisdom there. That whatever the matter of the case may be, that there's a deeper wisdom in achieving something greater and letting go of the little trivial things or in, in, in relatively speaking trivial things. Achieving this greater sense of peace is worth it if it just means erasing this little thing. Right? There's a sense of wisdom that it doesn't mean that he's giving up on his faith. It doesn't mean that he's, he's, he's giving up who he is. But he's thinking more broadly, more deeply about what he wants to accomplish. And he's trying to accomplish that. As our community grows and as we're in a position where our community is going to become far greater in size and number in the next few years, we need to think about how we as individuals and as a community can be a resource for the people around us. Not just in terms of having prayer services and events, but in terms of other things, like civic engagement. How can we become a part of the national conversation in terms of how policies develop and whatnot? In terms of community service, how can we reach out to other communities and help them 
in need? How can we reach out to the people who are poor in need? That there are people not just across the world who are in need of aid financially, but there are people in our own cities that are in need of, of food aid and money aid. And what can we do to help them, our own brothers and sisters who live in our cities here? Like in Wilmington, there are plenty of brothers and sisters who would be in need, who would benefit from sadaqah and zakat aid. But where do we, what, do we, what, do, what programs do we have to help those brothers and sisters in need? What do we do to work with those brothers and sisters? It's important to keep this in mind because there's a sense of wisdom in how we coordinate things. On an individual level, there's a commandment in the Qur'an to enjoin good and forbid evil. To Amr bin Ma'roof wa Nahi anil Munkar. And we understand that at an individual level, there's a wisdom in how we implement this. That the, it's not simply saying what I think is right and trying to stop people from what I think is wrong, but that arguably more important than that is how I communicate. That if I see someone and I say, oh brother, why are you dressed like this? Oh sister, why are you doing this? That to me it may seem like I'm saying something right and I'm helping this person out. But when you look from their perspective, it might seem hurtful, that they might, from their perspective, feel that, oh, this person is telling me something is making me feel bad. And this person will feel isolated and left out. And if you think that's not a big deal, that it's something, you know, not serious, then think about this. If you estrange one person from the masjid, on the Day of Judgment, when we're all standing in front of Allah, what is that person going to say? That, oh, I tried to come to the masjid, I tried to come to this, but they made me feel bad. And so I felt unappreciated and I left. It might sound trivial, but what are they going to say on that day, on the Day of Judgment? And the way I communicate with other people is extremely important. And I need to understand what people need rather than what I want to give them. Because what people need is what I need to give them, not what I feel like saying. One of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, his name was Abdullah. And he used to make the Prophet ﷺ laugh. And People used to also make fun of him. His nickname was Donkey. And what was his thing? He had a drinking problem. He was an alcoholic. And then someone in the crowd yelled out, Oh, curse this man. Curse this man because he keeps doing the sin over and over again and he never learns from his mistake. And what does the Prophet ﷺ say in response to that? He explicitly stands up and says to that man, Do not curse this man. Do not curse this man because I know that he loves Allah and his messenger. And what is the significance in him saying this? Because he understands that what Abdullah needs is not for someone to beat him down and criticize him. That he understands that Abdullah, who is addicted to the substance and is trying his best to get over it, who is trying his best, does not need someone to beat him down and tell him all the things that are wrong with him. But rather what he needs is encouragement and affirmation. That he does in fact love Allah and his messenger and he needs that sense of affirmation. And the Prophet ﷺ provides that for him because he understands that need. And as our communities become bigger and more and more people come in, and we need to think about how we can reach out to people who are beyond the people who just who come on a regular basis. We need to think about how we are communicating and how we can bring those people in. A litmus test, for example, for a masjid of the future, say, would be what would happen if a girl not wearing hijab were to walk into the masjid? Because this, is, this, is, this type of question is important because it opens up a lot of discussion about how we treat people. If this person walked into the masjid and someone says, oh, why are you wearing this? Why are you wearing that? And this person feels left out, this person feels attacked in a sense, you know, this person doesn't feel welcome, then this person will just, you know, won't really be engaged by the masjid. And that's not what she needs, that's not what people like this needs. That what we need to do is to bring in people. And in doing so, it requires a sense of patience and wisdom. It requires a sense of understanding what, how we can communicate with people. And if you don't think this is significant, there are thousands of people around the nation, thousands of Muslims who would benefit 
from reaching out to people. That the masjid needs to be a place for everyone. Where is the masjid for that person who comes in and doesn't really come that often, but just wants to come and you know come closer to Allah? Where is the masjid for that person? Where is the masjid for the guy who has slowly stopped praying salah because he has gone through hardship and hardship in his life and he feels as if Allah has abandoned him and he has slowly let his religion fade. Where is the masjid for that person? Where is the masjid for the girl who went through school and didn't really have any friends because on the one hand she was Muslim so she couldn't engage with a certain group of people but on the other hand the Muslims didn't really make friends with her because she kind of didn't fit into a certain mold. And she slowly falls into bad habits and becomes on drugs and all these things and slowly falls out of line. Where is the masjid for that person? And if you don't think that's significant, I can guarantee you that there are thousands of people across this nation just like that who are in need of, of this sort of support from our communities and we don't provide that. And we have to think, where is the masjid, where is the community for those people? On an individual level, what can I do to reach out to people to bring them into Islam? Rather than trying to push them out by promoting a certain specific mold of Islam that I feel is correct. A Bedouin comes into the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ and he doesn't really know where he is or what he's doing and he urinates on the floor. And you know, people start freaking out and saying, oh, what are you doing? But how does the Prophet ﷺ respond? He understands where this person is coming from. He understands that this person doesn't know. Right? So he doesn't make him feel bad and attack him. Rather, he deals with the person in a way that's relevant to his context. A man comes to the Prophet ﷺ and says that he wants to commit zina. What does the Prophet ﷺ do? Does he say, oh, astaghfirullah, how could you do this? How could you even think this? Does he make the person feel bad for having these thoughts? What does he do? He sits down calmly and guides the person through it. He responds to the person in a way that's relevant to how he needs to be taught. He tells him calmly, would you like it for your mom? No. Would you like it for your sister? No. Would you like it for so and so? No. And he slowly leads him through this chain of logic. And by the end of it, he makes dua for this man and says, oh Allah, protect him from the shaitan and so on. And after that, this man never had anything to do with zina, is what the hadith tell us. Because the Prophet ﷺ had a wisdom in how he interacted with people. And as our communities expand and on an individual level, as we try to reach out to people to bring them into Islam, when you think about how we can implement that wisdom into our lives, that we think strategically in terms of everything that we do, that there's a give and take in everything that we do, that sometimes we don't get what we want, and sometimes we have to accept things that we don't necessarily like. But in exchange, we get something far broader. And that's this idea of unity in Islam, that the shaitan has given up on the shaitan has given up on getting you to do major sins. Instead, he focuses on getting you to do minor things, on forming divisions between the Muslims. And you see this all around the world. You see this in our own communities. You see this in individual masajids. That the shaitan tries to play his little tricks to separate people. But there's a wisdom in how we respond to that. That we, try, that we do embrace this sense of compromise and discussion and listening to others rather than just saying what we want. And that's how we get this idea of unity. That the Prophet ﷺ teaches us that Muslims are like bricks. And if you imagine bricks in a, in a house, every single brick reinforces the other. It gives each other brick what it needs, rather than harming it or pushing against it. They stand together in unison. And that's what gives them their strength. And that's something to think about, that the example that the Prophet ﷺ gives us in this story, that when he negotiated the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, that he demonstrated this sense of patience and looking in the long run with wisdom. And not only was this a prudent decision, but Allah reinforced this decision that he said this is a great victory. And this is something that has lessons for us to understand in how we carry ourselves as individuals and how we work with our communities and the people around us, our families, our classmates, our workmates, and so on. That we need to think about how we can be intelligent and listen to what people are saying rather than harming others.